Okay, Colin, I'm back in black. Are you, are you still there? Hi, Jasper. I'm still here. <laughs> okay, good. Good to know. Sorry about that. I was just uh, I was just preparing the insights, which I'll try and do. Oh, okay. Well. Yes, we don't so have I'm a just... spare man for insights and Twitter updates this time, do we? Yeah. Okay. Let's try and multitask. Yeah. So I'm going to. Uh, I was just getting the post organized as best I can. <laughs> well done, that man. Okay. Uh, let's skip through these. So um... we'll try and do that. So if we hear clicking in the background, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Clicking and furious typing. I'll try and keep it quiet, but sometimes the keystrokes pick up. Yeah, if you hear. Anyways, well, I'm ready to start any time you are. Okay. Yeah. And, and, I'll try and guys, and if you hear quiet. a kind of whimpering sound, that that's Colin's trade not working out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so we're we're going through the uh, the risk warning here. We've got our Canada. Risk warning on the screen here for our Canadian clients involved. And that's about it. So there we are. We've got a 13-minute countdown happening here for these. Uh, what I should say is it was, it's all these numbers that really count, Colin. What do you put the most emphasis on this time around out of the figures? The headline? Uh, I, yeah, I'm looking at the headline number and the average earnings, I think, will be really important because... Uh, one of the things we're looking at here, I mean, we, we've had a lot of Fed speakers out the last couple of weeks, and they're basically saying, you know, the U.S. is approaching full employment, which has been increasingly clear for quite a while. The um, inflation also is starting to pick up. And, and one of the places that I've been noticing inflation pick up, both in the U.S. and in other countries, is in wage pressures. And the, the Fed's kind of been downplaying it, but the truth is that wage pressures are stickier inflation, like uh, inflation driven by oil, oil prices or... or uh, commodity prices it goes up and it goes down but wage prices are stickier usually once wages go up they're like dividends people are loath to cut them back down mm -hmm. so that's that's what i call real inflation so yeah. that's one of the numbers where uh, we're really keeping an eye on here and and the reason a lot of people are focused on, on non-firm payrolls today in, in particular of course is because we've got the big fed meeting coming in a couple of weeks fed meeting coming in a couple of weeks a lot, number of Fed members, including some of the big ones like Fisher and uh, and, and Dudley, and Yellen was a little more balanced, but still, and, and Mester and, and some of the other um, regional presidents have been saying that September is potentially a live meeting for a rate hike. Why? Because the Fed didn't raise rates in June. If you were looking at every six months, they missed June because of Brexit, even though they blamed it on a soft non-farm number, and it was and it was really all about Brexit. And and so this would be the catch-up in September. And, and then perhaps they could go again in December or in March. Uh, the, so the options really are Fed raises in, this, uh, in September or Fed signals September for December is, is probably what we're looking at uh, going forward. But the non-farm number will tell us which one uh, is more likely. And, and so we've been running above 200,000 uh, this summer since we rebounded from the, uh, the weak May number. And, and so what I've been considering is that if we get another non-farm number above 200,000, we'll probably see the Fed raise rates this month. Mm. If we're between 100 and 200,000, and it's 50-50, maybe they will, maybe they won't. If it's below 100,000, then the Fed will probably use September to signal for December. One of the other things that's been going on lately, and it's been coming from uh, Rosengren and, and Dudley and, and a few of the others, is the Fed has been talking down the threshold for uh, for non-farm payrolls needed to raise rates. So people used to think, well, they would need maybe 250 or 300 to actually put through a, uh, an increase. And, and they've been saying, depending on the Fed member, somewhere between 50 and 150 as being okay and indicating a, a decent, steadily growing uh, job market. And, and it makes a lot of sense because if you're approaching full employment, you would expect, as anything else, that the, that the rate of increase would slow. You would expect job was uh, non-firm payrolls to growth to slow as you approach the, the the it's not a physical barrier but let's just call it a, a psychological barrier of, of full employment wherever it is because i mean if you're at i mean if you're at 100 percent, then you can't go much higher sure sure yeah yeah you get to a point where there's there's no more people left to actually take the jobs so <laughs> when you reach 100 percent right. employment yeah and, uh, and back to your point uh, about right. wages so obviously that, that, that you know it's a good uh it's a good market to be to, to be switching jobs at the moment because you know less people available for work. You know the employers have to bid up how much they're offering to those who are left and those who are in other places of work. 
Absolutely, and that's why we want to be looking at the average earnings as well, because that's another sign that will show us we're getting close to full employment. Is that you? You see the 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 um, payroll growth slow and the wage growth increase. What do you say? So is a hundred thousand? Is that is that the the sort of low bar for you on this call? Plus a hundred k. You still think um, December is on the cards? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that plus 100k and I think plus 200 uh, September is probably, is probably still in the cards because it just feels to me like the Fed is, is ready and wanting to do this. I think they've reached a point where they're... Uh, what, what intrigues me, though, about it is that the uh, the election's coming and um, in, in a couple of months. And, and so it, usually the Fed tries to stay away from election campaigns so we, we can pretty much forget anything happening at the October meeting. So it's either now or December, really, yeah. is what you're looking at. You're looking at. But usually they stay away from it. And it's interesting that they're even talking about it, which I read is one of two things. Either the um, the Fed wants to show that the economy is, is good, good and uh, and certainly that would that would favor anything like that would favor the Democrats because they can say, well, look, we've been managing the economy for eight years and it's doing great. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you hold off because the economy is poor, then that favors the Republicans because then they, of course, have been going around saying, well, we need to fix America, our economy is broken, our economy is broken. And, and uh, and so on. And but if you do make a move, then the, the other part of which is well, maybe the election's not so close after all. It's uh, it's hard to say, but there's different ways you can read that. And I think looking at this uh, non-farm payrolls report, you'll probably also see some political spin try and come out of this as well. This one and and the next one, and and perhaps even the one to follow, uh, because we've got today and one or two more before the election. And I think they'll probably both sides will be trying to spin that depending on how the numbers fall out. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Below 100,000, expect the Donald to be tweeting a lot. <laughs> 200,000, so. <laughs> Hillary's in, but yeah, that makes sense. Well, I guess another thing to make notes about this August number is that August is reportedly the most volatile of all the, the months, also the most hard to predict, and also the, the month that gets revised highest in, in subsequent revisions. So often this number that we're about to see is a lot lower than what it, we eventually find out it is two, three, uh, one, two months down the line. So maybe that re that's a reason to believe actually we do undershoot this consensus, which is, uh, you know, 180,000 still, still pretty reasonable. So I think so. And it's pretty much in line with what we got from ADP on Wednesday. You know, um, any, uh, I'm just going to quickly have a little quick look at, at gold, if I may, Colin, just because I think we're a bit of a, I think Absolutely. you even tweeted, didn't you, that someone did, that um, we're at a pretty key juncture in, in gold. And uh, <coughs> this, so this is my my daily chart here. So this is, this is kind of like a, a weekly swing point. I suppose you can see it easier on the uh, the weekly chart here, where we're obviously making higher highs here. A uh, little falter here, but pretty much making higher lows uh, but at this point we're, we're trying to make a lower low having just made a, a lower high at the top here below the 1375 peak we made this year so we're, we're basically below this previous low and we're at this this previous peak um, we've had a good rebound off there this week but uh, depending on this number it's probably going to determine whether we finish above or below that pretty much that 1300 mark is quite an important pivot for gold so I would say you know, maybe a scenario that we're looking at here is if the the number does come in a bit weak, then uh, you know you would assume that would be just immediate positive off this uh, off this uh, off this uh, chart for gold, yeah, and uh, that would be an immediate rally point. If it does come in strongly, well, then we're looking at challenging this one three hundred. Then it's a matter of whether we break down through it, or whether it just turns out to be another fake out and we can push higher still. Um, that will be you know the reaction in this chart. And, uh, and some of the major currencies will give us a good indication of where the kind of market is interpreting things for um, the likelihood of a, a rate hike. Any charts that you're looking at particularly, Colin? Uh, yes, I wanted to, uh, if you could, Jasper, could you put up the uh, the Dow or the SPX, whichever one? Because I think you'll see trading is going to be focused in two areas. One will be gold, uh, primarily because it's the U.S. dollar, and, and so we'll see big moves in gold and other currencies. What's going to be important also is how do stocks uh, react to the news? And, and the reason I say that is because there's two ways that the markets can react. Uh, they can look at it as, as a liquidity play where bad news is good news, where uh, if, if you got a miss, that might mean the Fed holds off on interest rates and up goes stocks. Or mm. If you get a, a huge win, then uh, 
then the Fed goes hoggish and, and down goes stocks. So there's a liquidity aspect, but then there's also the earnings aspect where uh, a big miss uh, could mean a weak economy. And, and we saw this yesterday following the uh, miss on the PMI. It, it actually sent stocks down initially because people went, well, gee, if the economy's uh, not doing so well, then the corporate out the outlook for corporate earnings goes down as well. So it'll be interesting to see which side do stock traders take because uh, his, for most of the last since the financial crisis really traders have gone mostly playing markets on liquidity where mm. you know, bad news was for the economy was good news for liquidity and up goes the stock market and vice versa but we have seen that points over the last year year and a half where traders kind of have gotten beyond that and focusing more on corporate earnings in which case then they should be in gear with the uh, with the economy so we'll see what happens with uh, with that today but i think it'll be important because we're looking at stocks in general u.s indices have been looking pretty tired here i remember historic september is historically the worst month of the year for stocks we often get a big correction between mid-august and mid-october the july bounce was right on schedule in terms of seasonality so do we get a correction here of a, of a downward style correction or are we going to get a sideways correction where we see markets just kind of churn out for the next six weeks? And, and of course, we've got the election effect in there as, uh, as well. So today should give a better indication of that, whether we're into a, into a sideways consolidation or whether we could get a, a sharper pullback yeah. in the markets. Yeah, I mean, just, um, just technically here, sort of sh trying to show my chart, that, you know, this is the, the weekly chart for the US there. So you can see that we've, We've broken that previous record high, but we really haven't gone too far since. And we're at the moment, a bit like in gold, uh, it's at a bit of a pivotal level. We're basically, we've tried to break down below that previous record high on a couple of occasions, including this week. Um, if we get a close below that previous record high, to my mind, that, that's what will open us up to that, that bigger that bigger pullback, which which could just stop at this previous peak here, but I have a feeling where it would be a it would be a challenge down at eighteen thousand again. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think over. I find it interesting because I see a lot of people calling for the market about to to fall apart and things like that. But in actuality, when you look at it and you look at the uh, the economic and economic environment uh things are actually starting to are, are looking like you know this could be a, a sideways consolidation but more of a mid-cycle pause before we go up again it'll be interesting to see but actually one more quick one if you could just pull up before we uh uh get the numbers could you pull up uh, either the ibex or the italy please because i just wanted to show something there on the uh, in continental if you're able that would be fine is this the the European markets that have been lagging, so so we've mm -hmm. seen the U.S. do well, we've seen the U.K. do well. We had a golden cross in the DAX this last week, but if you look at things like Spain and Italy and France that have been really, really struggling throughout the year, they actually look like they're getting ready for a breakout. So that's something also that's uh, that's quite intriguing here, and uh, and I'm interested to see are you going to get a bit of a reversal in in performance where some of these have some some catch-up room but still the point is if the if things are about are these things a leading indicator that things are about to fall apart or are these things getting ready to catch up and i think that's another thing we want to be watching here and we're down to, and we're down to less than a minute to go here, here. We go. less than a minute to go so we already seen a bit of a reaction in gold here uh, see that little push got my i've got a rally oh, one other thing to uh okay, i'll push these over here sorry. one other thing i should note is you've got but everybody, everybody is really focused on this number, but also it's a long weekend in the U.S. and Canada this weekend. So I think what we'll see is probably a huge amount of volatility right off of this. And then, of course, around 9.30 when the exchange is open. But by, uh, but by noon, things will probably settle out because people will start taking off early to go to the cottage and wherever else they're going. Yeah. So we're getting some dollar weakness going on here with about 20 seconds to go. Um, you know, maybe an assumption of a... Uh, a weaker headline here, gold pushing higher, euro pushing higher. Is that a squeeze before it goes the other way? Uh, you know, certainly some some tight stops will have been taken out. We're, we're dropping the other way, taking the stops on the downside now. It looks like we just this is what you've got to be careful with these this data. Oh, there we go. It's a bit weaker then. 150k. 151. <coughs> Unemployment rate ticked of, up. Look uh, at that. 20k the last yes. month. And the wages lower as well, Colin. What do you what do you make of that? So you were mentioning the wages. So that, that 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 wage element and the unemployment uh, rate, bit of a shocker there, particularly. Um, and uh, we're getting some dollar the, weakness is following through. 
Yes, so it is, it is seeing a little bit soft. It does come in as dovish and takes a bit of the pressure off of the Fed to uh, to raise interest rates in September. So we could see them, uh, pro I, I think they might then use September as a signal for what they might do in uh, in December. But the non-farm payrolls, if you factor out the uh, the 20K increase here, would be at 171, so still a little bit below the, uh, the street. Private payrolls uh, had a big upward... Uh, we actually came in even more disappointing, 126k versus 180k. So the government must have propped things up, and uh, and overall the uh, things were a touch soft on inflation. So, yeah, I think we're looking at a little bit more of a uh, of a dovish read to this. Let's see, what are the? Uh, can you bring up the US 30 here, uh, Jasper? Absolutely. It looks like we're getting a mixed. We're probably seeing a little bit so of takeaways bit, from yes. both sides. So this is a this is the one hour thing. Yeah, we've tried to push up to the top side. Yeah, Mark a bit undecided what to make of this. Maybe that, that stock uh, reaction is symbolic of what's about to happen in the, in the dollar. Because if, as you're saying, really the Fed's still in play, but just um, a little bit delayed, maybe, maybe this, um, this dollar weakness is going to be used as an opportunity to, to buy it up. The, the, yeah, the language from the this Fed is... is Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the, you know the the language from the Fed here is is the difference maker, and uh, you know you can use that um, you know discussion we were having about the the, the stock market to say that um, whether the stocks react positively or negatively to to what this you can say is maybe bad news ish <coughs> um, is dependent on the language of the Fed, and if the Fed are talking up the chance of a rate hike, uh, that's going to you know, and then we see bad data. That that's uh, the market's reaction, as we saw yesterday. The PMIs was well. We don't want the Fed hiking if the economy's looking like signs of, of weakening. Um, so that you know maybe that that plays into it here. Um, we're getting a bit of a pullback, Colin. What do you, what do you think? When do you think this this market really yeah, starts to I think we're still out? seeing mixed reaction here because like the data is a little bit disappointing, but it's not terrible. I mean, I mean it's not an it's not an awful report so, uh, by any means. The uh, it's just kind of middle of the road, and I think you'll probably see that it's it's not bad enough to to rule out a rate hike this year. You certainly still could get one in December. Uh, September is looking a little more iffy now, but uh, but it's not a uh, it's not going off the rails either. So and and hourly earnings up 2.4 percent, uh, you know, missed slightly, but uh, but they're still at 2.4 which is still running above the uh, above the Fed's 2 percent inflation target. So it's more of a I think in this, this, and probably what we're seeing it in the stocks, especially, is this just kind of muddies the water and leaves things uncertain. It's kind of like Yellen's speech last week, where you, you could read anything into it, and I think, in a lot of ways, you could read anything into this uh, particular report uh, as well. And, and and I suspect that each side will uh, will find a way to spin it the way they want uh, coming out of this. I'm just going to uh, see if there's any changes to the. Uh, on the Fed fund side, so we were at 36% on uh, before the numbers came out, and now it's 34% for September and 58% uh, chance of a hike before the uh, before the December meeting. So uh, overall, like this, the the the, the, um, the bond traders are taking this as neutral to just slightly dovish, and I think that's what we'll probably see in the uh, in the markets as well. So. Um... So based on that, we could see some choppiness through the morning, and I'm just looking here uh, while we're at it at the uh, at the trade figures, which also came out at the same time and are also getting uh, will get overshadowed, of course, but we can mention them. So U.S. trade balance 39.5 billion deficit, street expected 41 and a half, so a little bit better than expected. Uh, Canada trade deficit was two and a half billion dollars. Street was expecting 3.3 billion deficit, so that was a uh, uh, a little bit of an improvement there uh, for Canada. So those were uh, those were the other data we've got out uh, this morning at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern time. We get U.S. factory orders, which uh, which also could uh, create some interest if there's if there's any kind of a significant uh, surprise. The street's expecting two percent after a one and a half percent decline last month. And, and here's uh, I'll just, I'm just dragging in uh, WERP as you were mentioning before, so chance of a hike, Colin was mentioning, pushed up a little bit to 34%. What was it? I'm not sure what it was pre-meeting. I think it was more in the region of 30%. Has that gone up? 
Uh, it was at 30, yeah, it's still up. It was at 30% right after Yellen talked and before Fisher had his interview. Mm. And uh, and it was at 36 this morning right before the numbers came out. So it's still sitting right in that kind of middle of the road And then, uh, we're, and then we're in the sort of uh, approaching 60% chance the market's pricing for a, uh, a hike in, in December as we currently stand. So you'd imagine that um, the Fed is... Uh, going to be aware of market expectations and they're not going to try and raise rates into a, a 40% chance unless they really try and change that percentage in the next few days following this report but as you said this report you know had this report been a real blowout they might have really tried to to push September but you'd imagine that probably the the talk is going to be a bit more orientated towards just lifting the chances in in December in the, in the following days all that into to my mind the interpretation market yeah, that's what I'm thinking so we're seeing the gains extended at the moment, so no sign of, um, of a, an immediate backlash the other way. But two considerations are, as Colin mentioned, the fact that um, you know, in the US they're heading off on their holidays in a, in a couple of hours, if, having, if not having done so already. And um, the other thing that if this is still generally okay for the Fed, you know, Colin was talking about 100K as a base, a few people talking about 150K, so it's obviously surpassed both of those. Mm -hmm in terms of a sort of lower limit for what's acceptable for the Fed, then actually, you know, this this move could fade for, for both of those reasons. So be 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 savvy to that. Um, That's right, and so we could still see some choppiness today, and, and it's something that I know some people have, uh, our traders have pointed out uh, recently as well, is that we're, we've seen um, over the last few weeks, a lot of late-day reversals in the uh, in the market as well, as though you kind of get uh, one move directly related to whatever the news of the day is, and then quietly at the end of the day, then you see things settle out. But I, I think today, really, the end of the day trading might be more like noon rather than uh, rather than between three and four, because I suspect that uh, that a lot of people are going to shut down this afternoon, and then whoever's left, of course, is. Uh, usually on the desk is of the uh, just sit there and don't make any waves yeah <laughs> yeah ride it out to uh <laughs> to home time um, to try to <laughs> any um any questions Watch from any, the, um, any any questions from any of the attendees here any um kind of queries you have on this data or just uh any particular charts you wanted to look at in the sort of final seven minutes we got here in this this webinar uh if there are if there was anything you had in mind Send it through to the, the Q&A box or actually, have I got the chat window open? There we go. Um, yeah, if, if anyone wants to send a chat message or a Q&A message, uh, either to the group or to me or Colin personally, feel free to do so and we can, we can get into that. So we're seeing a spike in the Euro, Colin, but also Germany 30 pushing higher as well. So... Um, not necessarily a sign that's of it's the um, you know the European markets not necessarily reacting to the the spike in the euro here though as you said maybe just a, a sort of long term belief here that actually this is just a hiccup in the road and the euro can head down as the Fed pushes towards a uh, a rate hike in December. <clears throat> Yeah, I still think yeah, I still think they're probably looking towards a rate hike in uh, in December at this point. But uh, I, I think September is probably out. I think that I think what I think a lot in a lot of what was happening with Dudley and Fisher was that we had gotten to the point where the probability of a hike was getting down close to zero, and the probability of a December hike was yeah. uh, getting down close to I don't know something like thirty percent. I think, and I think what they were trying to do in a lot of ways was keep the street from getting carried away. And I think that's what they saw was that, and then you know people were starting to push out no rate hike till you know well into 2017 when, and and so I think they started talking that way to kind of rein the market back in, and the Fed will probably be happy with this of 30 to 40 percent September and around 50 to 60 percent for uh, for December on the Fed funds is probably where they want to be because they don't want to get boxed in by the market. They're they're still the central bank and they're supposed to be the world's premier central bank and they're supposed to tell the market what to do, not the other way around. And I, I think sometimes uh, some people get ahead of themselves and they, they think that the markets can tell the Fed what to do and then it's every so often the Fed has to come out and remind them who's in charge. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Although, of course, in doing that, they are putting their own credibility at risk because obviously they tried to do the same thing in, in June, 
But then, as you, as you mentioned, that, that poor NFP report came along, a um, bit of soft US data and, and obviously Brexit, uh, and they had to just um, pull back. So they made a bunch of noises that uh, a June rate hike was on, then it, then, then it never happened. So it's a bit of a similar sort of thing going on here for September. So I guess they have to, um, <coughs> they have to match up um, adjusting expectations, but, you know, but still keeping it realistic. I think, but I, I would agree at the moment it, it is realistic to, to hike rates in December. That seems yeah. like uh, where they're going to position yeah. the market for now. <clears throat> uh, I've got a yeah, couple of questions here, election, Colin. I don't know if you... And Yellen's speech from... Yeah, go ahead. No, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to say we've got a couple of questions. Actually, two separate yeah, questions on, uh, on dollar yen. Um, and then another one just on... on uh, okay. Is sterling um, affected by the Fed um, against a basket of currencies? Well, you know, when you're looking at sterling against a basket of currencies, obviously the biggest component of that basket is the dollar. So it's going to have the most individual effect on the counter to any kind of UK economic news. But obviously um, <clears throat> Brexit has, has, uh, has kind of increased the, the kind of pound impact on, um, on, you know, on particularly sterling dollar, but also the... Uh, the uh, the pound basket so you've got to say what's happening domestically in the uk is probably the biggest driver of the pound against the basket of currencies but you know if you're looking for the the outside influences certainly the fed is is well up there for for a multitude of reasons absolutely and and, and i think we're seeing that uh, on balance the pound is starting to recover now and uh, and uh, even if we leave out cable for a minute because of the uh, the us uh, the us effect but if you start looking at pound against the yen pound against the euro in particular it's it's starting to break out and and we've seen a good bottom form in in the pound over the summer and it's now starting to recover so i would say against a basket of currencies it's definitely looking uh, looking like overall the the worst is behind it and it's starting to uh, recover on, on the flip side of that then we'll go into I'll, I'll mention the yen versus a basket of currencies which is that the yen is generally weakening whether it's against the dollar the euro the the loonie the pound you <coughs> name it the yen is uh, is starting to weaken because Japan's economic data hasn't been that great. Uh, the the Bank of Japan members, uh, Kuroda and others, are still talking stimulus, mm. and, and and the Bank of Japan has a meeting this month, and a lot of people are starting to speculate that they might. It's been long enough that uh, that now they might be ready ready to start to do something else in terms of stimulus. So that's why you're seeing, particularly in the all this particular little movement in the dollar yen because you had the speculation that well you could have the fed going one way and a week later you could have the bank of japan Kuroda and the bank of japan going the other way and and so we're starting to see that play out but but we're also getting the uh, the pound yen as has been quite active on the recovery and sterling so yeah. those are a couple of the more active yen pairs at this point yeah i just pulled up the uh, the euro yen pair just because i um uh well i like the rsi i know you do as well colin which is quite a fairly distinctive downtrend line in the the weekly RSI on euro yen, um, getting a little bit of a breakout here, and we get an RSI pushing up to 50, um, corresponding with a uh, a low around a long term support level around 110, and a, and a seeming a higher low here. If we pull out to the the monthly chart on dollar yen, we can see that there's been some big time tests of this 110 level in the past, and it seems like this this decline um, in the yen pairs, and obviously appreciation of the yen seems to have stalled out that obviously coincides with dollar yen which we've just had a few questions about at the key 100 level it, it's looking a bit like uh, we could be on for a uh, a double top here in uh, sorry a double bottom here in in dollar yen yeah and on top of that something to consider is, is that as we see for example, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, we had all these fears about China, and through the middle of the year, we had all these fears about Brexit, and and a lot of that is subsiding as well. But that's a lot of the things that uh, reasons that 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 defensive hit plays like the yen and gold got driven up so much in the first half of this year and now we're seeing gold has rolled over and starting to come down and now we're seeing the yen start to break as well so <clears throat> had a few questions on um, you know how what what was the indication here that that uh, you know that dollar yen would drop <clears throat> and uh, and euro would rally going into this obviously no one knows the <clears throat> the data beforehand um, but, uh, but technically, you can start to spot some kind of signs of weakness. And we ran into that 104 level yesterday. 
and then saw a pretty sharp reversal and you can just see on the daily chart we put in this shooting star bearish reversal here and so having retraced I would say that's probably ends up being about 50% of that daily candle uh, if I'm <coughs> able to accurately draw that enough on there and then we drop down in terms of time frames <coughs> Okay, you can see it was the 61.8% retracement of that. Oh, well, was it? Yeah, there we go. See, that's um, you know, that's uh, technical analysis working quite well for you there, giving you a little bit of an. Even if even if this level hadn't played out, <coughs> you know, as it was a kind of decent risk to reward ratio. If the if the data came in weak for those selling up in this region uh, to push down to the lows with only just the the risk up here to the previous high, so. Um, some technical basis for uh, for uh, going short up the dollar yen before this. We get we, you know we're not getting quite the follow through. We're getting starting to see that snapback that we said was um, was a possibility here, Colin. Some of these losses in dollar yen being given up. Whether we can close below this support in my mind is probably the determinant. And whether this down moves gets any follow through in the in the short term, because uh, as we were just saying, it kind of seems like these yen pairs are popping to the upside. So maybe. Even though we're due a bit of a bigger correction, the downside doesn't seem like the most favourable one to be on at the moment. Did you have any interest in looking at um, a dollar CAD? Uh, we don't obviously have the Canadian employment uh, sure, data, though, but, um, uh, but why not? Eh? Sure, let's bring it up. Yeah, we didn't get we don't get Canada until next week this time, so it's a uh, it's often fun to be able to compare the two when they both come out uh, simultaneously. <laughs> And uh, but uh, what we're seeing, is dollar CAD's been getting mostly knocked around lately by the uh, ups and downs of the oil price. Yeah. And uh, and so we had a big pullback in oil yesterday, and it was kind of stabilizing today. And I believe from your Brent chart, it was looking like oil's picked up a little bit off of this as the U.S. dollar eases back. So uh, but and, and yeah. so we're seeing that roll over in the dollar CAD as well. So some resistance came in around 131 and 131.20. And it's rolled back under uh, under 131 now, but the 130 level is a biggie. It's still the uh, the 50-day average and the. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to bring it up on my charts here. It's got a uh, there's a whole pile of indicators for uh, at right at 130. It's the uh, there's the big round number there. There's also the. Uh, Cat. So a big round number, a 50-day uh, a retracement level, and the 50-day moving average all right near 130. So we're dipping back towards that, but that's really the key support for that one. If we see dollar CAD is, is start to break 130, uh, would actually also be, also be indicative of a bigger correction in the uh, in the U.S. dollar as uh, as well. And I see we've got the dollar index back to 90, uh, back under 95.50. The big level for the dollar index really though is still 95. We've seen uh, uh, 96 kind of it tried to break above 96 and it's kind of failed so uh, this tells me as you ease back towards 95 that again it's this kind of neutral fed level where mm -hmm. yeah they probably won't raise in September me but they, they probably will still signal that they're uh, that they're ready to go in December yeah so more data watching to come eh? after this yes um, it'll yeah. be interesting too to see I guess is, is, is as we look at some of this data coming through over the next uh, month or two is whether the uh, just as we saw the brexit vote in june had a bit of an impact on, on some indicators in the uk is does the u.s election have an impact on uh, on some of the data in the united states absolutely and that'll be hard to measure unfortunately that's something that we probably won't know for sure until three months after the fact when we've all moved on and it doesn't do anybody any good but <laughs> it's just something to keep in the back of your mind I'm actually glad we pulled up this um, dollar CAD chart because I think again going back to this, well, how do we how do you trade non-farm payrolls? You know, um, yeah, the, I mean, just the the result itself today is evident that the economists have very little idea, or you know, what the number is going to be. The the consensus being 180,000, you know, is actually 151, so off by nearly 30,000 jobs. Um, I've we've certainly seen bigger misses than that in the past, but obviously it's difficult to predict. But you know, this dollar CAD pair is a good example of where we've got a pretty well established zone of resistance up here in uh, in dollar cad we're coming into this uh, non farm payrolls release we've had two candles stalling into this previous resistance zone um and then 
you know, and then as it happens, the data comes in and confirms it. Um, you know, that's not always going to be the case, but I think the the idea here is that you know, if you're at a kind of low risk area on the chart, as in you're you're selling at the top half of the zone uh, of the of the uh, the price range, you know, hoping for a drop down towards the middle or the bottom of the range. You know, if if you're selling close enough to the top, your 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 risk is limited, but your potential gain is a lot more. So, uh, you know, there's these kind of um, economic announcements, uh, the kind of thing that trigger these these moves to take place off these technical levels. Uh, absolutely, and the other great thing about nine farm payrolls is it's, it's often there's big surprises in it because it, it's a figure that's quite volatile. It's a figure that's revised quite a bit, and uh, and between the two, that it, it is hard to guess. And when you look at something like this, I try and when I look at non-farm to, to factor both the headline number and the revision because that's important. So, for example, like last month, you had a 20K upward revision, so your bar's been raised. So if you factor that back in and, and the, the revision back into the headline number, you'd be at 171 versus 180 and, and it's important because some months I mean this month it was 20,000 but some months it can be 50,000 in, in the revision so it it makes it uh, d difficult to, uh, hey, Colin, look, to read in terms of how do you do it and it's already coming through Trump's so already out there for great trading action and <laughs> there, there <laughs> didn't he is. take long <laughs> and uh, but when we go on uh, on Twitter we have uh, non-firm payrolls guesses and I think guesses for a lot of people is the uh, is the word because it's pretty hard to come up with anything definitive but it makes a, it makes a great a great market action that's for sure <laughs> okay so i guess that's it we're over running yeah, a bit here so good. thank you very much for everyone for attending i hope you've got some some good trades off there we've got a good um you know good across the board kind of weak report um well weaker than expected report which has pushed the the dollar lower so um because it doesn't seem like there was any real conflict all of it was a bit weaker we're seeing that that kind of dollar weakness hold for now, and um, and the stock market gains hold for now. But obviously, bear in mind, uh, the U.S. are off on holiday, so um, you know don't necessarily expect these uh, gains to extend too far into the close. Thanks a lot, Colin. Agreed. Thanks. We'll probably see a choppy morning today, and then. Oh, thank you, Jasper. Thanks, everybody.